You ever notice when dinner doesn't go exactly how it's planned, it's never a good thing? I have an illness. One of the things that relaxes me is to watch home shopping networks. I don't order items off of them, but I love the sales pitch. And I can literally watch it for hours to see as they go from item to item and see how every item is so vital to your life, just as vital as the item before it. And the item coming up will be just that vital as well. But how they shift in their sales present, it relaxes me. It calms me. And I saw one evening an air fryer on the Home Shopping Network. Now... My love affair with health food is well documented here. <clears throat> and if it tastes good, I eat it, which no health food does. And so I see this air fryer. And I don't really care as much about the calorie content and all of those claims. What I care about is the fact that I'm not allowed to have a deep fryer. Because Brooke values the places we live and doesn't want them to burn down. And so she has forbidden me from investing in a deep fryer, which was a dream of mine that I had to let go as part of the or worse vows that I made when I was married. But that's fun. So then I saw the air fryer, and that wasn't even going to be a conversation. If I'm going to lovingly listen to my wife and not buy the full-on deep fryer, then she's just going to have to be okay with me getting the air fryer. And so I'm like, hey, babe, I'm going to go to the appliance store. She's like, what? Why? And I'm like, there's this thing that will change my life. And she's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, an air fryer. She's like, you don't need an air fryer. Which, she was wrong. I did need it, but I wasn't even going to debate that with her. It was just, I really want it. And since I'm willing to not do the deep fryer, we're going to get an air fryer, okay? And she's like, you're not going to like it but that's fine. You can go get it. Yes. Well, she was wrong. She was wrong. That thing changed my life. You have not had a bag of frozen mozzarella sticks until you've tossed those babies in the air fryer. Oh, and chicken tenders. Don't even get me started. It was like I had been a two-year-old and discovered, like, some brand new food for the very first time. Like, these are so mouth-wateringly delicious, and yet the outside has a crunch that is so good. This is great. I loved it. And then I got a little carried away. I started going online, and I wanted to broaden my horizons. I wanted to expand. I wanted to see just how far I could take my love affair with the air fryer. And so I decided that I was going to make some hamburger patties in the air fryer. And so I tossed six of those bad boys into the air fryer, shut it, the start of the air fryer, and promised Brooke and the boys that we didn't need to go to any fast food restaurant. Oh, no, Dad's got this one. And what you're about to taste is going to be as good as any fast. Now, granted, I don't have the packaging and the toy. It was like, go pick a toy out of your toy box already. You're not getting a new toy. But other than that, your meal will be phenomenal. I promise you this. Well, a couple minutes into me cooking the burgers, Brooke, who has a nose, like, it's it's just, I can't even comprehend what the love of my life is able to smell. Like she can smell things minutes before they occur. Before we even walk into a, walk into a place, she'll be like, oh yeah, they've got this scent going. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like we will be two miles away from the movie theater. And she's like, I can smell the popcorn. I'm like, that is not possible. <laughs> but she has this super nose, which is really annoying to live with, quite frankly. All right? It's really annoying to live with. And she's like, those bur- you're going to burn those burgers. Those burgers don't smell good. You're- those burgers, I'm like, 
Baby, that is the smell of beef cooking. There is no greater smell in the whole world than red meat that is cooking. It just signals to everyone, you are about to have a feast. It is cause for celebration. And I'm like, you you don't know what you're saying. We're fine. And then smoke just starts shooting out of the air fryer. And I'm like, baby, do you not think that when Burger King's flame broiling their Whoppers, there's a little smoke? Just the price of a good meal. And then the smoke alarms in the house started going off. And they are ear piercing. And they are wired. One of them was wired into the electric of the house. And then there was another one that was battery powered. And so it's a January day. We've got our front door open. We have the back door open. We've opened the windows in the kitchen. My wife is on a kitchen chair with a towel going like this over the smoke alarm, trying to get it to stop going off. She's like, would you please stop cooking those burgers? And I'm like, baby, we're all in now. We can't turn back. She's like, this house is going to smell like burnt beef for a week. I'm like, what's wrong with that, baby? (laughs) What is wrong with that? If they made that candle, sign me up. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and so we left our doors and our windows open and we let those burgers cook. And I pulled open my air fryer. And it looked like something had been cremated in there. Those suckers. <laughs> and I found myself at this crossroads of whether or not I admit failure. And the answer to that question is obviously not. And so I took one of those charred burgers out of that air fryer. I slapped it down on a bun. It went through the bun. You could hear the dink it made against the plate, but I was undeterred. I went to the drawer, and I got out a piece of lettuce, and I threw it on. And I looked at an onion. I'm like, not cutting it for this. Nope, forget that. Went and got some ketchup and threw it on, put the top of the bun on, took a bite, and my teeth hurt. I was like, well, apparently we're going to get something else for the boys and for you to eat for dinner tonight. I'll go get it so that I can eat it in the car and not admit failure in front of you all. When dinner doesn't go like it's supposed to, it, it seems like it never goes well. Our house smelled like burnt beef for a week and a half. Every time walked in, she's like, never again will you cook a burger in an air fryer. Never again. What I've learned is just don't throw six of them in at one time. <laughs> that will make your house smell for about three days, but the burgers will be delicious. Delicious. This morning as we continue our, our series looking at finances, what we're calling currency, we're going to see a dinner. In a dinner that goes different than anybody would have expected at the outset. It's a dinner where Jesus has been invited. And we're going to look at Matthew 26, starting in verse 6. And you can follow along with your Bible apps on your tablets or your phones. You can follow along there. And if, if not there, then on the screens on either side. But we're going to see a dinner that goes a little different than anybody would have thought at the outset. And how a lot of this centered around money. And how it reveals something about each of us. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Now I just want to stop there because there's there's a couple things that, that I want to point off right away. Simon the leper. Simon had had leprosy. Now he wouldn't have been able to be in the community at the time with leprosy because it was a very contagious disease. And what happened was they would put people on the outskirts of their town. And so we understand that Simon was one of the individuals that Jesus had healed. He had come alongside, he had had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus had healed him of his ailment. He'd healed him of his leprosy, and now he's welcome back into town, and yet he still carries, he still carries the marks. And some of you have been through something really traumatic in life. Some of you have been through things that are, that are really hard to go through, and you carry the scars to this day. And maybe in some people's minds, they look at you and they label you. 
They look at you and they see you and they, they see you for, for who you are, but they also see you for what you've had to overcome. They also see you for your past mistakes. They also see you for that just that huge seminal moment in your life that you had to face. And you're no longer just who you are to them, but there's a qualifier along with you. And, and that's the case of, of where Simon is here. And he's an outcast to much of society. He's somebody that people are suspicious of. He's certainly somebody who, when he was sick, people wanted to keep all their distance from because they didn't want to catch what he had. And yet what we see here is the fact that Jesus sees the value in everyone. Jesus sees the value in everyone. He sees people beyond just just what the qualifier is, and he sees them at their core. He sees them as their individual. He sees that every person has value. Every person has worth. And he sees that in people. And at Lakeside, we strive, and one of our values is we will be the same, that we will see people beyond the qualifier. We will see people beyond just their past mistakes. And we will see the value and the worth in every single individual. Because as we we strive to follow Jesus, we see that this was a, just a key part of what Jesus did. This was key to the heart of Jesus. And so as we are people who want to follow Jesus, this needs to be key to what we do as well. And we need to strive to be just like Jesus and see the value and the worth that everyone has to offer. And at Lakeside, that's what we're about, that we see beyond and we see that you matter and you've, you have value and you have purpose, just as Jesus and encountered everyone. He saw them that way, and so will we. A woman came up to him, up to Jesus, with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. That's a little different. That's a little different. Now, we know from one of the other biographers of Jesus named John that this woman was named Mary, and she had had a lot of hardship in her life as well. She, at one point, was demon-possessed, and Jesus had healed her, and she'd had an encounter with God, and it changed her completely, just as Simon had had an encounter with God, and it changed him completely. And so understand that if you have an encounter with God and it's a legitimate encounter with God, you will be changed. You will be changed to the core. You, will, you can't leave an encounter with God being the same way as when you showed up. That isn't how it works. And if you leave what you think is an encounter with God, then something along the way got lost in translation because a true encounter with God will change you at your very core. It will change who you are. And here is Mary, who at one time was also an outcast, a laughingstock of society. The the lady that people saw and thought she's absolutely crazy. She's out of her mind. The people that ran, the, she was the person that people would run from, that people would mock. She was the outcast. She was the person that everybody else saw and thought, well, it could be worse. I could be like Mary. And then she has an encounter with God, and it completely changes her as well. And she's at this dinner with Jesus and Simon's house. And she takes this perfume that's incredibly valuable and she pours it over Jesus' head. The smell of it fills the house. It's so fragrant that it fills the house and it overtakes any other smell. And if you've ever been around someone who wears too much perfume and maybe they lean in for a hug and it starts, it starts with the scent of smell, and, and, you, and you smell it, but, but then they wear so much perfume that it works its way down, and you can start to taste it in your mouth, and you're like, oh, 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 that's, that's awful. That's, oh, this is, oh, God bless you, go in peace. Like, you, you, seek, you, you wait to see where they're sitting, right? You wait to see where they're sitting in church, and then you're like, I'm going the other side, because that's just way too much, huh? And... And so if you've ever been around somebody who wears too much perfume, you know that it can, it can be a little, a little much. 
And she pours this expensive perfume over the head of Jesus. And the smell of it is so fragrant that it overtakes all of the food. And everybody who's in the house can only smell this perfume. And the disciples are mad. They're mad about what she's done, but they're not mad about it because of how it smells. They're not mad about it because they can't, they can't smell the food anymore. No. What Matthew tells us is this. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. They see what Mary has done. That she's taken this perfume that was worth a year's salary. It's incredibly expensive. She pours the entire bottle over Jesus' head. The smell is everywhere. It's all-encompassing all throughout the house. And the disciples look at the scene, and they are beyond upset. They are indignant, like somebody has pushed their buttons for the very last time. They're absolutely furious, and they're like, this is just wasteful. Why would you do this? Why would you take a year's salary, buy a perfume, pour it all over Jesus' head? You know how many people you could have fed with that money? Do you know how much good you could have done with that? They're indignant, they're furious, and it leads them to questioning her. And listen, this is why it is so, so, so dangerous when you find your value, when you find your self-worth, when you are constantly seeking everybody else's approval. This is why this is so dangerous, because there are going to be times where you have to do things in life. There are going to be situations that you've gone through in life that have changed you to your core. There are going to be expressions that you want to make that other people will look at you and they don't understand for the life of them. And sometimes those decisions that you have to make will lead other people to be upset. And sometimes it will lead to them questioning you. And sometimes people are just going to shake their heads and say, I don't get it. And if you place all of your value and all of your self-worth and what everybody else thinks and says and feels about you, you will never be fulfilled. Because you can be on the right track and you can be doing the right thing. But the vast majority of people will look at it and say, you're wrong. This is why it's so dangerous. Because here are the disciples, the closest friends that Jesus has. They see this go down. They see what happens, and they're mad about it. And beyond mad, they are irate. What about the poor? Do you have any idea how much good you could have done? How many mouths you could have fed? Do you have any idea what you could have done with all that money that you just poured on Jesus' head and wasted? And there are some well-meaning Christians, and quite frankly, some not well-meaning Christians, who will sometimes look at us, and who will question, who will question what we do, who will question you on whether you have too much, whether you live in a house that's too nice, whether you drive a car that's, that's too nice. And quite frankly, it's none of their business. But there are some well-meaning Christians and honestly some not-so-well-meaning Christians who will look at you and constantly question, are you doing what you should be doing? And oftentimes it will be under the skies. Do you have any idea that you could do this or you could do that? Or do you really need a house that big? Do you really need a car that nice? Do you really need that wardrobe? Do you you really need what? Do you have any idea what you could have done with that money? So there's always going to be critics. There are always going to be people who want to look at you and who want to judge you, who want to look at you and say, you should have done it this way, you should have done it that way. And that's why last week we talked about the need for us to set our target. That we have to decide what is enough from the outset. And that what's enough for me may not be enough for you, or it may be too much for you. And that doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong, and it doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong.
Here's Mary, whose life has been changed. Jesus has completely changed her. She takes a year's salary, buys this perfume, and pours it over his head. And the disciples say you could have fed a lot of people with that money. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. That's what to worry about. Don't worry about the haters. Don't worry about everybody else who constantly wants to judge you or question you. Forget it. You're never going to make everybody happy. So stop trying. Please, just stop trying. You will drive yourself insane. Worry about whether or not what you do brings God glory. Worry about whether or not what you do is all right in God's eyes. And forget everybody else. Jesus sees the motives. Jesus sees her heart. Jesus sees what really matters and what's really important. And all the disciples probably think that they see her heart. But they're missing it completely. And Jesus sees what really drives her. And he says this, For you will always have the poor with you. But you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Jesus says, stop. Just cut it out. And then he says something that's troubling for a lot of us to hear. He reveals a truth of life that's difficult for us to really encounter and for us to process and for us, honestly, to come to terms with. No one will eradicate poverty. No one will eradicate poverty. And so when you hear people pitch a plan and promise that they have the solutions, when you hear people that come along and talk about that they, they have a way to get rid of poverty, it's not going to happen. And that doesn't mean that we have to like it and we have to be okay with it. And we should celebrate that fact. But this is just a reality of life. And Jesus draws attention to this fact. He says, stop telling her what she did is wrong because of all the mouths she could have fed. You will always have the poor amongst you. Always. Her sacrifice was something that was so much larger. And it was so much bigger. He said, in pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And here we are 2,000 years later looking back at a woman who took a year's worth of salary, bought a perfume, and poured it on the head of the one who had changed her life and who has changed so many of our lives. And if you haven't had an encounter with him, will change your life and change you to the core. Her actions are told to this day. They were misunderstood. They were ridiculed. And they were criticized. And yet, they're remembered because they mattered to God. And then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is fascinating. Matthew, in writing the biography of Jesus, tells us about the scene in Simon's house for dinner. He tells us about Mary, and he doesn't mention the cost of the perfume. We have to go to other biographies of Jesus, Mark and Luke and John, to discover just how much this perfume cost. 
What's crazy about this is Matthew was a tax collector before he followed Jesus. Take the feelings you have right now about the IRS as you're getting ready to start your annual joy of filling out your taxes and filing those. I know, so much fun. Woo-hoo. Take those feelings and multiply them. Because while you might feel like the IRS is ripping you off, legitimately, Matthew could steal from people. And there was no legislation against it. In fact, it was completely up to the tax collector. They had to get a portion that they would present then to the Roman government, but they could pad their own pockets as much as they wanted. So Matthew comes from this background where he's a tax collector. He comes from this background where he is very familiar with finances. And he doesn't mention the cost of the perfume. And yet, what's he follow the story of Mary and Jesus at Simon's house with? The story of Judas. One of the disciples who has his own agenda. And Matthew is the only story of Jesus, the only biography of Jesus that tells us how much Judas sold Jesus for. Mark, Luke, and John do not share with us the amount of silver that Judas received. See, could it be that Matthew, in writing this story, sees that the great cost to Mary is not something to be highlighted at all because there is no cost, ultimately. What she has done is something that is beautiful and is something that will be remembered. It will outlive her. It will leave a legacy because it touched the heart of God. And Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. See, what can happen is sometimes the things that we put a price on, the things that we think are so valuable, are so important, they blind us and distract us from what is ultimately of the most value and of the most worth. Money will reveal your motives. Money reveals your motives. If you want to know how you feel about something, if you want to know what's really important to you, if you want to know what you value, if you want to know where you place all of your importance, look at your bank statement. It will show you. And the challenge for us as people who follow Jesus, is to make sure that we're putting our money where it matters and we're making sure that our motives align with what our our heart cries out and with what our mouths proclaim. And we might feel like it costs us something. It certainly cost Mary a year's worth of salary, and yet looking back, it cost her nothing. Because she touched the heart of God. Let's make sure that we are outliving ourselves. Let's make sure that we are leaving a legacy. Let's make sure that our motives are clear and that our motives are pure and we never allow ourselves to become so blind and so consumed that we sell out what we truly believe and what we truly value. For something that is so small.
in comparison. But God is good. And he would take this betrayal and he would use it in the story of our redemption. Jesus would be handed over to those leaders that Judas sold him to. He would be tried and unable to really be convicted, and yet they'd keep trying, and they'd keep trying, and they manufactured a crowd against him, and they ultimately decided that they would kill Jesus, and yet the reason that they killed Jesus was because God had put a plan in place even before the history of this world. And the reason that God had put a plan in place before the history of this world is because God knew that we would rebel against him. And yet he loved us anyway. And so God made him, Jesus, take our place. And he went, and he died because the cost of our mistakes, the cost of our shortcomings, the cost of our sin is death. And yet God loved us so much that he's given us life everlasting and a chance at a renewed relationship with him. Jesus would die on that cross, but three days later, he'd raise again. And this morning, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And let it be a cause for us to examine our lives, examine our hearts, and question, what are we going after? What has our focus? God, I pray, that we would be people who are not worried about the critics, not worried about trying to appease everyone, but are worried about doing what's right. Worried about living lives that honor and glorify you. Pray, God, that we would make choices that outlive us. That we would leave legacies. That we would be faithful. That we would understand you've given us everything. And that in appreciation, we would give back to you Highlighting our faith. Showing our reliance upon you. And asking you to bless it. Allow us to leave a legacy. Not for us. But that your name would shine. God, we remember your love for us. And your sacrifice. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.